folks could be settled in. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this last accountability session of 2022. I'm Dirdley Toner. This is my first meeting in public as a newly appointed chair of the board, so I'm trusting my colleagues will be patient. I would like to place on record my thanks to Doug Garrett, Tom Frawley and Colin McKenna, who all stepped down at the end of November, and to formally welcome new independent members, Les Allenby, Kate Laverty and Peter Osborne, who join us now. A special welcome today to Graham Bigger, Director General of the National Crime Agency, and to your team, and of course to the Chief Constable and your team. Thank you for the report submitted, and in respect of tackling serious and organised crime, there have been clearly been a number of notable successes, large and small, which no doubt you will wish to elaborate on. Chief Constable will be taking your report first and then moving to discussion with Graham on NCA activity in support of PSNI. And of course, members may have issues for both of you on that topic. But before we do, as a board, we have published two significant reports with recommendations over the last two weeks. One dealing with professional standards and in a first of its kind for policing here, a report on the human rights of police officers and staff. We will, of course, be following up with you and others around the recommendations made, but each consider important issues around con conduct and organisational culture, and we hope that these add to the message sent that inappropriate behaviours and actions will not be tolerated. The report today particularly looks at the human rights of officers and staff within the organisation and their treatment. 
there are some complexities that apply to particular issues given the legislative powers and duties conferred on police officers. However, police officers and staff do have the same right as everyone else to respect for human rights and fundamental freedom and to work in an environment free of harassment or discrimination in any form. There's a lot covered and the report also highlights increasing numbers of assaults on officers in policing and indeed other emergency services. Sadly, in the course of the last month, we've seen two attempted terrorist attacks, which the board condemned and other incidents where officers have been assaulted on duty. So this report is very much recognises the duty of care that we have. On the budget, turning to your report, centre stage is the current budgetary position. And whilst the budget has been set by the secretary, there was very little Christmas cheer in the allocation to PSNI this year, or indeed for subsequent years. We are now at the stage where we and the public need to understand in detail how the pressures will impact on actual service delivery and how service, the service received by the public may need to be reshaped going forward. Chief Constable, there have been a number of incidents over the last number of days that members may ask for updates on. So we'll take some introdu introductory remarks and move to questions. Thank you. OK, well, uh, good morning, uh, Chair and new Vice Chair, and welcome to Graeme, his team as well, and uh, some of the new members, which hopefully in the break we'll get a chance to do introductions and then start explaining some of our unique jargon and terminology. So we'll try and keep within the, the bounds of uh, plain English today. Uh, thanks for the chance to comment, um, Chair, and uh, welcome, obviously, to your first meeting with, with EGA, and we, we look forward to building on the relationships we've enjoyed hitherto and recognise how important it is. And clearly, uh, it's good to see Graeme here today. We've got some plans for next year in terms of keeping the momentum in relation to tackling organised and paramilitary crime, which you reference and may well come up later in the questions and, and how we align the skill sets of both organisations. So we'll, we'll leave that to a bit later. Um, I'm conscious that this has been a particularly busy month and it's referenced in, in my report. And I, I go back to a phrase that I think I've described more than once that I actually put in my application form for this job a while ago about this place being a unique police service with unique challenges. And I think this month just re-emphasizes that given the breadth and complexity of issues that we're asking officers and staff to deal with. Clearly, uh, I sit before you here today at the end of a week where, amongst other things, we have the tragic death of Matthew McCallan. And obviously, I would extend as Chief Constable and on behalf of the senior team, our condolences to his family, friends and supporters. Clearly, uh, there's been a lot of public interest in what has gone on that's led up to Matthew's death. Uh, it's now engaged the, the, the coroner in an inquest and equally we, we made a voluntary self-notification to the Ombudsman, so we'll probably be somewhat limited in what we can now say to members in public or private today. But to reassure you that there is contact with his family and his family lays on arrangements in place as we now begin the investigation into his tragic death. As you say yourself, I think this month was defined as well as being clearly unique in the UK where we have seen two determined incredible attacks to kill or injure police officers and staff in, in the Northwest. And clearly, given the progress we've made over the last couple of years, it's a worry. But I can again assure you that from briefings I've had with Mark and colleagues about the scale of the pace and the impact of the organization uh, in terms of in, in, in investigation, we had a really good meeting with the Secretary of State uh, the other week where, in fact, the senior investigating officer and his team and also superintendent from the district, I think, did themselves proud in terms of the determination, but the, 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 the reflection of the effect of these attacks, not just on us as an organisation, but some of the sentiment that's come out of the community in terms of support for policing. So a sort of a double edged sword there. Um, I was myself out that weekend and uh, some subsequent days, and I think sometimes uh, when you go into the organisation and see us in, in those particular times of scrutiny and stress for different reasons, I just pay tribute to the, the stoicism and commitment I saw firsthand from people in all sorts of different roles that were responding to the threat that was in, in, in front of them. And again, it's just testament to their resolve and commitment. Um, there'll be a number of matters today, I think, that are flying around in the public domain, particularly in the last week, that, as you say yourself, Chair, may limit whilst there, I know there are issues of public interest, because of ongoing proceedings and in various fora, we may be limited 
what we can say at this point in relation to a number of those, either in public or private, but we'll see how we go. But clearly, again, the main issue of strategic concern to us remains the budgetary pressures. And we, we will be able to try and give some context to where we find ourselves. But clearly, um, the allocation sort of helps us balance the budget for this year, albeit it's a reducing one. But I think the signal we'd like to send is that whilst we will work within our means this year and still see reductions in officer numbers and then um, what we're able to do, I think the bigger debate is starting to come as we sort of understand the budget into next year about how difficult that is going to be, either in reflection of the, the Herculean Evans, uh, uh, efforts that Pamela and the team have made to, to reduce non-pay costs this year have been remarkable, but in a sense, we're just maxing out the credit card to next year because we're pushing some of that delay, for example, renewal of building works and things into another financial period. We can't kick, keep kicking the can down the road forever, so I think the potential problems will be far, far worse into the new financial year, and we will touch upon that. Clearly, we've made commitments this year to protect call handling and neighbourhood policing, although certainly in relation to neighbourhood policing, we will be coming to you soon with, with, with evidence once we've agreed it about degradation in numbers, so the debate will shift from headcount to what sort of service the public can start to get and, and I'll try to give you that clarity you asked for. You will see from the report itself and from um, a whole host of uh, social media and outbound sort of contact with the press and public over the last few days, we've launched our Christmas crime reduction campaign, which has four themes, which we'll come back to later under the banner, Tis the Season. Uh, we've seen a crackdown on wanted offenders over the last few months, which has brought nearly a thousand people to book. And also, yesterday, I thought some really good work led by Lindsay Fisher, part of Mark's team in the public protection branch, to do a day of action targeting people in this space of violence against women and girls. And as you probably saw yesterday, 39 arrests across the country and, and some really constructive messages and publicity. On the horizon, as we sit here alongside, if you like, the breadth of normal policing challenges, Chris uh, is beginning planning in relation to our role that we can see in either facilitating uh, picketing and protests linked to industrial disputes or indeed where we will be asked to step in to support the role of other 999 emergency services as they go on strike and again be another example of how our own workforce will start to get stressed in the unique times that we face. Um, clearly as we end the year it's been a year marked by various anniversary and events not least of 100 years in policing and you've seen over the last few months through either individual events or things that members have been able to support some of the reflections that we've done, including the announcements of the museum, which continues at pace. Looking forward to uh, early into next year, we may touch on a particularly in private session, uh, the forthcoming inspection for His Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary. Uh, there's clearly some important themes in there, which we'll see inspectors in with us in late January and then in February, and we'll probably comment on some of that as we go into questions later. And then finally, before we sort of pass the baton back, it's a chance to, apart from welcome new members, also welcome everyone to a safe and happy Christmas and wish them a prosperous new year. So, thank you. Thank you, Chief Constable. Um, I have some questions, so I'm going to go across to members. So I have the first question is from Linda. It was a question on the search operation from Matthew McCallum. Thank you, Chair, and I suppose first of all, just to place on record our condolences as a board and my own condolences to Fran and Pete, Matthew's mummy and daddy. And obviously this is a very difficult time and it's a it's a very it's very fresh, so it's very emotive. But but for me, I suppose the, the important thing is that the family have some questions about the search operation itself and, and then the lead up to to Matthew being tragically found as he was already deceased. Um, I think that it's essential that there's good communication now with Fran and Pete, and I know that there are family liaison officers in place. I, I met with family yesterday, but we need to ensure that they get the answers to the questions that they have. They need to know the what, the how, the when, and the way. It's really important that they get that. And I think if there's learning from this, and I understand that obviously there has been a referral made by your sheriff to police ombudsman's office. However, these things can take quite a period of time and I think the really important thing now is to have, if there's a possibility of having some type of review to see were the right things done at the right time, can we improve it in the future because 
when I spoke to Matthew's mummy, the really important thing for her, <coughs> nothing is going to bring Matthew back. But the important thing for her is that no mother is ever in this position again. And that everything that can be done is done in the future. Everything that can be done and learned from what happened, if there is learning from it, can be improved for the future so that we have better outcomes in the future for young people. So can I just get some assurance during that? And, and obviously we will have further questions in relation to this issue, but I think for today, we keep it very broad and, and obviously it's an ongoing issue and as I say, very emotive and very fresh for the family. So they will have questions that will need answered, but today is not the time for that to happen. <coughs> Yeah, th th thank you, Linda. I, I mean, th this is such a heartbreaking case. I mean, many of us in the room are parents, and you can only imagine the different levels of emotion that are coming in tidal waves at the moment trying to make sense of this. But Mark, um, who is in the room today, he, he is our goal commander, so our, our senior officer overseeing the response to Matthew's death. And we have begun the process, just to reassure you, to say if there are fast time lessons, that we can learn, that, that don't prejudice anything the coroner or the ombudsman is doing. There's a commitment to, to do that, and that's not gainsaying any judgments about those early golden hour responses, if you, if you excuse the jargon. Um, but we are committed to dialogue uh, with, with Matthew's family, because as you say yourself, inevitably some of these processes are engaged. They do take time, sadly, and, and people want the answers more quickly than sometimes the processes allow. So. Um, Certainly, I know Mark has been heavily engaged in, in both the fast time learning, making sure the investigation takes place at pace because we're here to support the coroner, uh, and, and also ensuring that where we can, with, with there's good communication with the family. But I don't know if you want to say anything else, Mark. Thanks, Chief, and thanks, uh, Chair. Um, yeah, I suppose at the outset, I do want to just place again um, my own condolences personally. Um, such a tragic case. and. Um, I have, as, as the Chief says, as the Gold Commander, I have been obviously looking at what our response is. Um, what we've done, there was considerable amount of um, police actions undertaken at the time, as you would expect, and um, a, a tremendous effort. Um, I understand the hunger, both by the family and the community, for answers around some of the questions that they have, have raised. We are already taking out the learning of this and, and looking at that. And we're reaching out to some of the community groups who want to, to engage and who have questions, as well as the family. Um, and as we said in, in a media statement, we have, through our family liaison officers, offered for senior officers to come and speak to the family at a time that is appropriate for the family, because that's the most important part of this. So. Um, as the Chief says, we've made the, the voluntarily, uh, voluntary notification to the Ombudsman. It's not a referral, um, it's a notification because of the public interest in this. Um, I have looked at this um, and, and been managing it as, as Gold Commander. There has been a, a tremendous effort um, from the moment that, um, that the report came in. But we, there will always be learning and we are starting to take that learning straight away and, and reaching out to, to those concerned, and particularly the family. Thank you, Chair. I think that that has, and I think you're right in what you say, Mark, in terms of at a time that's right for the family, because obviously these days are, are their time for what, to be with Matthew, and I think it is important then, in, in the aftermath of that, that, that that hand is reached out again, and that contact is kept through the family liaison officers. I think it's really, really important communication with the family and the community, as you've said, will be key in the coming days and weeks and months. Thank you for that. And we just want to really express the board's condolences to Matthew McCallan's family. We wish to, we wish to note that. The next question is from Michael. Uh, it's on the budget. Hi, Chief Constable. Uh, good morning. Um, the report to board format is certainly bringing um, much greater visibility to the performance and highlights clearly now the very significant uh, matters of public interest around the implications for underfunding. Uh, noting the financial outlook for the next year is daunting, which you've, you've already alluded to. But at the same time, um, we see in the KPIs and the reporting metrics that recording, recorded crime, domestic abuse, hate crime are trending upwards with a sharp increase 
in online child abuse referrals as well. Just thinking in the context of your forward to the report and sort of welcoming the support of the board there, I suppose what I want to ask you is, could more focused um, metrics or KPIs be distilled down, um, which draw attention to the challenges of increasing demand, crime trends, reducing capacity in terms of available resources, critical response delivery, 999, 101, et cetera, and the increasing deployment of uh, police to non-PSNI activities as well, really just to help the board in highlighting to the public um, in, in more tangible ways the challenges that you're facing and help us with our, our supporting role in that respect. Yeah, thank you, Mark. I, I mean, it's a really constructive suggestion. Um, I think in many ways we're in the same place of an, an inquiry into what data tells us. Um, so I'd like to, and I know I'll bring Aldrina in uh, because she's been sort of working hard on this with the team. But I, I'd really, so, sometimes some of the data that we can share publicly has to have a time lag because of uh, some of the rules around statistics. But to get to a place where we can give insight both to yourselves, other partners and the public near real time, I think it'd be really constructive. And I'm trying to see, working with Aldrina and the team, where we get to that notion of the balanced scorecard so you can see the effect of inputs on some of the other key outputs and certainly an emphasis on things that are crucially important to the public, particularly starting with call handling and then response. But I'll let uh, Aldrina give you a few headlines to show you what we're doing at the moment. Okay, thank you, thank you, Chief. Thank you, Michael. Um, Michael, you're absolutely right. It's um, the process we're trying to get through now through development of a force management statement is to do exactly that. It's to get a much more drilled down um, assessment of our demand. So it's a self-assessment of the organization. And, and in that process, we're looking across 12 thematic areas and over 30 areas of the service. So service delivery at a very um, branch level, essentially. And part of that assessment also is looking at the resource risks associated with that. So to take on, on board the point you're making in, in terms of looking forward, if we have further compromise to resources, what does that look like? So the output from that will be a full assessment of the demand and the resource as we currently stand. Building on that in terms of the KPIs and picking up your, your key point there, you'll know we're trying to build through the Pulse um, framework. We're building dashboards across the organization. So this week where it was, um, we were focused in very much on our violence against women and girls, for example, we've developed a very robust dashboard in relation to the violence and uh, against women and girls in terms of our strategy and our action plan and starting to build um, key metrics around those. So there's a process underway to do that. We're trying to align that to strategic priori priorities as we know now, but very importantly, coming out of the back of this will be, is if we are looking into um, further constraints, either way, this is what needs to direct our transformation program. So it will be about trying to realign and we very much will welcome the support of the board in relation to highlighting those the demand outputs from them assessments and the support and advocacy required to support policing to deliver on what's most important and and most needed for the public not least our 99 responses and others so, thank you just just closing on that thanks uh, chair um i i think the the points you're making sort of resonate pretty easily with me and i, I think if i think it, it would be representative of the board's view if we kind of you know, half a dozen or eight KPIs that we're able to visit on a regular basis and, and things that resonate with the public as well. I think that would be very helpful to us. Thanks very much, Adrian. Okay, thank you. I'll have a follow-up qu question on the budget and pay specifically from John Blair. Chair, thank you. And I'll thank the Chief Constable for his report. And add before I go to my question, uh, my sympathy and that of colleagues of the Alliance Party to the family of Matthew McCallum and also support to the police officers who have been under um, the threat of terrorist attack in, in recent times. The question, Chair, relates to police pay, and it's very general. Can we have an update on the current state of play with police pay claims? Yeah, thanks, John. And we're conscious of uh, police staff associations in the room today. We haven't got an update on the, the pay settlement, um, so we, do, we don't yet know um, the determination from effectively the permanent secretary now as to what the pay award will be, but as soon as we do, we'll communicate it. I don't know if anyone wants to add any granularity, but that's where we're at. And it's, it's frustrating in the cost of living crisis that we haven't got that clarity. Well, so I just add links to the question in the, in the wider budgetary piece, uh, John. 
So we did last week uh, receive our budget for the year. Um, so that beyond the contingency planning envelope at least gave us a certainty around the amount of money uh, available to us this year. And we did receive uh, additional funding in that budget, small, um, 10 million pounds, particularly on the main grant side of it. Um, and that really is there to help cover a pay award and, and will, would cover the pay award uh, as we anticipate. So the funding is there for pay. We just haven't been notified of what the pay policy and pay settlement is. Chair, I, I'm grateful for that answer. Can I ask in addition for me a, a very brief supplementary in relation to those salaries at the lower levels of the pay scales and if we're in a position where particular attention can be paid to them? Yeah, there's one development on that, John, and I know there's been media over the past few days, particularly with regards to uh, probationary officers, etc. Um, the first answer is we, we need to get the pay, pay policy and pay remit to see what scope we have to do that. But there, there is um, an area that we are looking into with regards to probationary officers uh, where we may be able to move them from point 1A to point 1B uh, sooner than had originally planned. Um, and that has been been the focus of Claire and the HR department, particularly as we look at the national living wage kicking in in April, uh, that we can support, particularly the probationary uh, officers coming through training. So, um, Mark's right with them. Yeah, Mark, Mark's right me a note. Um, yeah, that. Um, so, so we are looking at that, um, and I think the challenge has been in a lot of the reporting that the pay uh, in England and Wales was higher. Um, uh, for the for the lower bands than we have received. So that's part of our mechanism to look at that and bring it forward. Uh, we thought it would be more effective and more effective quickly um, when we per our original recruitment uh, mechanism and rhythm. But of course, due to the budgetary constraints, that has slowed down this year. So we're looking at bringing the effectiveness of that forward uh, than it would normally have been. So outside of that, that doesn't require us waiting on a pay remit or a pay policy. We can do that. And that's actually going to our senior management board next week. Okay, thank you. And we'll move over to Frank. You have a question on child sexual exploitation. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, Chief Constable, and I also had this for Graham, maybe sort of I'll pick up on it later with you. Um, child sexual exploitation to me is the most abhorrent crime that we have in our society today. Um, I'm the grandfather of 11 primary and pre primary grandchildren, and it's the biggest fear I have for them in their future. How can you allay um, my fears and all the fears of parents, guardians, grandparents, family members that there's going to be there's going to be significant inroads into the reduction of this crime over the I would love it a short period, but over the period of time? Yeah, thank you, Frank. I mean, obviously, it's it's in an abhorrent crime, and nobody of, of, of sort of uh, would disagree with your concern and, and its importance. Um, I, I'm through the chair, really. Obviously, Graeme will be here later to talk about the MC and some of the work they'll be doing around sort of internet based abuse. So, whether it's easy to take it together at that session. Um, no, we'll take it later. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Our next question is Mark. You have a question on the recent attacks on PSNI. Thank you, Chair. Uh, welcome, the Chief Constable and his team. Acknowledging and I suppose reiterating condemnation uh, for the recent attacks and the attempts on Derry and Straman and the threat on PSNI officers. Can I ask the Chief Constable of Intelligence Assessments in advance of these attacks indicated increased paramilitary activity and risk? Yeah, I think it's a very broad question, Mark. I don't think operationally we want to go into too much detail in a public meeting. Because clearly we, we get intelligence from a number of different places and it's maybe something we can cover better elsewhere, Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, can I move to Trevor, who has a follow-up question on the security issue? Trevor? Yeah, I mean, as, as you have alluded to in your report, I mean, the foreign actions of those who attack police officers whilst on duty and indeed use a civilian as a, a human means to take a bomb to one of your police stations water site. Um, can I ask in relation to that, how did the police get it so wrong in terms of calling it a hoax when it clearly sometime there turned out to be a viable device? Yeah, thanks, Joe. Well, at the end of the day, there was two phases to this. So if you followed the story, there was obviously the device deployed outside the front of the police station in the car. As per normal operating procedures, 
we would uh, sort of investigate that both with our own officers and then support of military colleagues to actually defuse the device and make it safe. So the initial assessment from military colleagues was that it was an elaborate hoax and it was when they carried out effectively a second opinion, a bit like when you go to see a consultant at hospital, they reassessed what they had before them and then decided it was a credible device. It was just them going for their operating procedures and we were reflecting on the advice we were given at different stages of the investigation. But there was no threat to the public in terms of what was determined at the time and then when the device was moved for a forensic examination. Okay, and I, and I can accept that. <clears throat> I'm sure you're aware about the human, human rights review, about use of force and indeed uh, some of the police officers routinely carrying sidearms. Um, I presume you'd be like myself, you would disagree with any move to disarm officers routinely, given the upsurge and the continuing violence that's, and threat towards our officers. Yeah, I mean, we're, at the end of the day, obviously the history that has enabled us to become pretty much the solely armed service in the UK, there's a civil nuclear police for different reasons carry firearms around the clock, but we carry, as you know, Trevor, weapons for personal protection, and then also we carry weapons to intervene in just like any other part of the UK in relation to armed crime, where life's at threat, terrorism, etc. But certainly there are no plans to withdraw firearms for personal protection. Okay, thank you. Um, Mike, uh, you have a question on strip search of under 18s. Yes, thank you. I'd like to, to, to follow up on this issue we've discussed uh, previously. Leaving aside the statistical errors and focusing on the strip searches that did actually happen, uh, in only one of the 27 cases was an appropriate adult present, uh, giving rise to the question, I think a legitimate question, uh, have there been any breaches of your own uh, code of practice? So my questions would be, why did this happen so often? Of the 27 cases, how often did the search produce something that we could describe as evidence? And finally, Simon, given you've previously said that you believe it's a small number of cases, how do you assess the impact of this number of cases on public confidence in the police service of Northern Ireland? Yeah, thank, thank you, Mike. I'll probably bring Chris in just because he's all sort of doing a lot of work in terms of our general use of powers and this sits in that sort of uh, suite. So rather than going down a, a wrong rabbit hole, maybe there's a lot of detail in that question that maybe if we can't get to the bottom of all the things you raised today, Chair, we can follow up with a written response that would give some insight. For example, when you look at proportionality in, in terms of the numbers versus the overall amount of other stop searches that we would do, etc. But do you want to bring a bit of flavour to the, the detail, Chris? Certainly. Thank you, Chair, uh, Chief, Mike. Um, so uh, it, it's a very um, sensitive area of policing, um, one that's quite emotive and does deserve um, thorough scrutiny, which is why we've um, recently reviewed our procedures internally. And, and I spoke at the last board meeting about the service accountability panel, which is which is part of that. But um, it, it's important, first of all, to, to appreciate the, the legal perspective around strip searches of, of children and young people and the need for an appropriate adult. It's, it's absolutely desirable um, to have appropriate adult present in, in every case that we, that we can. But the, the legal position is that where it is deemed necessary for reasons of urgency, um, that um, a, a, a supervising officer, so in, in a custody environment, that would be the custody sergeant, for example, uh, and the inspector can uh, authorise um, a search where it's deemed that items need to be potentially uh, taken from a child or young person for their own safety or the safety of, of other people present. Um, equally, there's an opportunity for a child or young person to decline the presence of an appropriate adult, uh, which is often the case as well. That might be for their own dignity um, or, or for other reasons. So we have to respect that decision as well. Uh, all of this needs to be recorded. Uh, so in a custody environment, that would be on the custody detention log, uh, which gives us that accountable um, record for, um, for scrutiny purposes. Um, what we've what we've done through the service accountability panel is that we have now determined that every instance of a strip search of a young person or child will be further scrutinised by that uh, accountability panel. So we met just after the last board meeting on I think the eighth of November. The, the data that we presented last time was was the validated data which we had up to June, <coughs> which uh, is the figures that you've you've uh, articulated this morning. 
Um, at that accountability panel, we, um, we looked at the data over the uh, immediately preceding quarter period, and there had been no further searches in that period. So um, we have a commitment to scrutinise each and every case through that accountability panel. But I, I guess a positive thing was that in that period, there were no cases, no further cases for us to scrutinise. But I do give the assurance to the board that we will be doing that at every service accountability panel from here on in. In terms of the ones that, that, we, that we did report previously, um, there were, of the 26 within the custody environment, there were two occasions where things were found. Uh, one was a mobile phone and one was class B drugs. Um, the other one search was outside of the custody environment as a result of a stop and search. And that was um, specifically um, based on the intelligence the officers had at the time, and that did result in the recovery of class A drugs. Um, so we're, we're confident that, that each of the searches that have been recorded so far um, are lawful. Uh, and in accordance with policy, but it's important that in order to be legitimate, we're, we, we're not just lawful, but we're proportionate and we're professional in the way we go about that. And that's what the service accountability panel is there to, to provide that assurance in the future. Hey, Chris, thank you for that. Just, just briefly, Chair, if I may. I think, I think two out of 26 raises the question of whether it's proportionate uh, to me. I would be interested to know uh, how, how often the juvenile declined having an appropriate adult present and how often there was no uh, appropriate adult present because you thought it was urgent as per your code of practice. But the broader point is neither of you have addressed public confidence arising from these strip searches where a young person is maybe going back to the community saying I was strip searched by the PSNI and they find nothing. If I may just come back briefly, Chair, so th that again, that will be something we'll be looking at with through the service accountability panel. Um, I mentioned at the last meeting the um, presence of the external reference group members that will form part of that panel and give us advice as well. Um, and of course, we're, we're available to report through this board and the performance committee with any of that detail. Um, and I will be looking into exactly those questions through that, that panel in the future. OK, thank you. And a supplementary question, this from Jerry. I think you may have, may have dealt with this, but just in case, I mean, imagine the service accountability panel, you only have to say, are there external members on it now? Because it would be very important, I think, that there are. Um, and then could I, and it's just to emphasize, Mike, and, and, and fairness to Mike's question, um, the, the, because I agree with him, do we, can we as a board get the statistics, you know, as we have, you know, 26 out of 27, we have a report on today, but surely if, if the number of you know children who declined, that, that information should be given them as well. Because it makes it easier for us to realise what's going on or what isn't going on. And, and I and again I, I have to agree with Mike. You know, twenty uh, six out of twenty seven or twenty five out of twenty seven does not sound right. It, you know, that, that it has been used out. Thank you. Um, in, in terms of the detail, yes, we, we can we can drill down into that granular detail. Um, the external reference group members were, were present at the service accountability panel. We had three members present at that time. Due to the, those are the three that were available. Um, we meet on a quarterly basis, but I'll be meeting with them and, and the members that, that weren't available on that occasion to um, receive some feedback and some reflections on, on the way in which the panels run, which is part of the, the value that the external reference group brings to this process. Um, and in terms of the proportionality, um, uh, when we drill down into the granular detail, we'll be able to reflect exactly how many did not have an appropriate adult present for which reason. But I think it's fair to say the vast majority will reflect that it was due to reasons of urgency um, to ensure that there are no items on the individual that could cause them or others harm. Uh, that, that's more often than not the reason. Uh, it is rare that, that, that a young person will decline themselves. Um, and in terms of the proportionality, um, as, as um, sensitive and, and, and emotive as, as this is and, and needs to be handled um, really carefully, um, we, we should, should be reminded that of, of the number of custody events. So the data that I presented last time, we were looking at a period um, up to June, 26 instances across 1,294 custody events, which equated to, to about 2%. Um, since then, the last quarter, there's been no further events, but there will clearly have been more young people uh, through our custody environment. So, it, so we're now you know, talking about one point something percent of custody events where this is, this is deemed to be necessary. So it is absolutely uh, carefully considered uh, and will continue to be so. 
Okay, thank you. And can I move on to Liz, who has a question on the recent murder in Newry? Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you to the Chief Constable for his report this morning. Um, a week ago today, Chief Constable, we witnessed um, a very brutal murder of, of a 58-year-old man, Mark Lavelle, in, in Newry, um, and this has undoubtedly left the whole community um, very shaken and very concerned, um, particularly around the nature of this and, and the time at which this happened, which was early evening. Um, since then, there's been quite a lot of media speculation in particular in particular in terminology used, um, which it gives the impression that there are concerns around repercussions of this. And this has undoubtedly created additional fear right across the community. I'm very conscious we have a family who are grieving at this time as well. So I just was, would like to hear from yourselves if, if you have any um, indications or, or any reason to believe that there are potential for further incidents and and also seeking assurances for the community that the BS and I are doing all they can to ensure that we do not see um, any further incidents like this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Liz. I, I mean, um, I'll bring Mark in in a second from the crime side to update on the investigation because it, 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 it is moving and there are some developments um, as you may have seen in the news yesterday. I think clearly you, you can only imagine the concern both uh, for family and then the wider community of a brutal killing like this at the time of day, not at any time is you know, the right time. It's, uh, it, was, it was an awful crime. As you'd imagine, um, we have stepped up police patrols in the area and we're also working closely with colleagues in Garda Shikona because there's a sort of a, a dimension to this that we, we would s see with them. A bit like Mark's earlier question, Liz, we, we can never give an absolute guarantee that we will be ahead of intelligence that stops something happening. But as you would imagine, we're using all the means that are disposable to try and mitigate any risk of reprisal or, or growing food, food, because this would clearly be a massive serious concern if there's a, a retaliation that escalates levels of violence uh, both here or elsewhere. But I'll just bring Mark in to give you some, some sort of insight of the things we've been doing the last few days. Thanks, Chief. Thanks, Chair. Um, yes, yeah, so we had two arrests and searches yesterday in relation to this, as you will have seen reported. Um, it is a live investigation, so I can't go into very much detail about that. Um, but, but yes, we are working very closely with district policing around the concerns that are uh, coming from the community around this. We're doing everything possible in terms of driving the investigation forward to bring uh, perpetrators to justice and to try and mitigate any of those uh, risks around reprisals. Um, it is a consideration and always will be in a, in a crime like this. Uh, and again, we're working very closely with um, district policing uh, around patrolling and uh, again, in, ensuring we're doing absolutely everything we can to, to prevent that and to reassure the community. But at this stage, that's about all I can say on that. Okay, thank you. I'm going to move on to Janet now, who has a question on the closure of Coleraine Custody Suite, but a follow up from Morris after that. Thank you very much, Chair, and good morning, Chief Constable and team, and thank you for the report. Yes, it's just very concerning the proposed closure of the custody suites in Coleraine, because Coleraine Station covers a very big area up around the north coast, and I know there's the, the new facility up at Waterside in Londonderry, but you know, does this mean that it's going to take two officers away from their regular duties while they transport a detainee up to um, Londonderry? You know, whenever teams on the ground are already really overstretched. Thank you. Thanks, Janet. Uh, and, and for the question, I'll bring Pamela in, who's been doing a lot of work around the cost of the model. Um, it obviously play into next year, as Aldrina said as well. But as you say, we're about to open a new centre at Waterside, uh, and there is a, then a consequence in how we sort of deal with arrests across that part of the country. But Pamela, thanks, Janet, for your question. Um, a lot of this precedes my time in PSNI and, and your time in the board. This dates back to 2014, when the business case was starting to be developed effectively for the Waterside. Um, and you're right, part of that was the consolidation and closure of smaller custody suites. And it links, as, the, as Simon says, it links to the optimal fit for purpose modern custody facilities. And, and that includes um, right down to sort of the nurse led model and, and mental health input and things like that. And the mechanism to do that is to have 
um, fewer number, larger scale, where we can consolidate and have that optimal service delivery. Um, so when, that was part of the 2014 case that, yes, Rain effectively would merge into Waterside along with Strand Road uh, and others. Waterside at the moment is due to complete um, around April time next year. Um, and there will be ongoing engagement and consultation uh, right across the geography, as you've mentioned. Um, we recognise that it, it does affect the flows, um, but that has been taken into consideration in the, in the workforce um, and, and what we need in that area. Um, but it, it is part of the modernisation of our custody um, effectively model. Um, but there will be, we do recognise that um, there does need, but the consultation will be around how we affect it as opposed to whether we're doing it. And that decision's been taken almost a, a decade ago. Chief and thanks Pamela. And does that mean that the will the new waterside facility have uh, have then themes like the maps team? Thank you. Yeah, the maps you mean the multi-agency triage, is that yeah, that's like I think a different provision. Um and that's actually some dialogue we're having with health mm -hmm. colleagues at the moment because of as we we like I me mean, personally I like to see that round the clock, not just on the level that we see it because you know it could be a debate for another day but um you know the continuing sort of concern about the amount of either detainees that have got various complex issues and obviously part of the solution is the nurse-led model which pamela mentions which we're also keen to see rolled out nationally but in a sense we're still negotiating with health sector colleagues uh, there is i know some developments where um they're now recognising some opportunities, probably in the pressures we're all facing, to see other different ways of working that are more efficient, but also more compassionate when you've got people in crisis, either in custody or elsewhere. But the actual detail of which office in which building, uh, I'm not sure of at the moment, but I don't think the MAP team is planned there, but we can double check. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Janet. And Morris, you have a supplementary for this. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, Chief Connor, I'd like to, to wel welcome you to the meeting, of course, but uh, can I ask what consultation has been taken uh, so far about the closure of the custody suite in Korean? And have you also taken into consideration the effect on the, the, the legal profession in the Korean area? Uh, and also that given the nature of the Causeway Glen, Coast and Glen's area, arrests made in Bally Castle could tie your officers up for five to six hours delivering uh, someone to a custody suite two to three hours from Corey and Port Rush, Port Stewart. That's tying up vehicles and manpower. Uh, and I, to me, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, could close the suite in Corey and the station was only built in 2004. Uh, surely it was built for purpose. Yeah, the, the, there are a lot of viable challenges um, there, Morris. But as, a, as Pamela said, this is, in one sense, we, we've been without trying to be defensive, inherited a, a, an investment and a decision that had its genesis some considerable time ago. And this, sadly, the length of time sometimes it takes to get a building even up <laughs> means that the world is catching up. But the, as Pamela says, and we can probably look at this in another place, uh, once, as Aldrina says, we've got sort of more clarity on the operating model, but we would prefer to get to fewer but larger fit-for-purpose custody centres because, sadly, and I don't want to tempt fate, but it, it, it is a high-risk environment. So we're there to both bring people through the system to, let's remember, to charge and put people before the courts, but we also have duty of care. And obviously the modern suites are far more effective in terms of cameras, life scan monitoring and all sorts of things, as well as just making sure, as Janet said, we've got the right range of services around so that we're, for example, not seeing police officers, not only having delays in transporting a prisoner to custody from a point of arrest, but then seeing them go off to hospital for five or six hours so that you know, the, the add-ons can be sufficient. There are mitigations. So for example, we have invested in more cell vans for the transportation of prisoners across the country. If you remember, that was an outworking of the work you did on spitting the bike guards with us. Um, but there are sometimes no finite and easy choices and the investments are also in other parts of the country to try and soak up some of that frustration of now I've got an hour's drive with a prisoner before I start a process. But I don't know. Mm -hmm. I suppose Antrim would be big. Yeah. yeah. The only point I would make is that there's Antrim there as well. So we've done significant work in the development in around the custody suite in Musgrave and as a satellite up into Antrim as well. So this is about replicating that model up into Waterside um, 
in, in Derry Lantern Thank you for, thank you very much. I appreciate that, but uh, they all take into account the new good roads that we have to Antrim and to London Derry. But you know, from a country boy's point of view, roads go both ways. So it's just as easy to get to to Corian as, as to get away from Corian. Uh, and it's part of the black hole that has been established for uh, due to a political lobby against the university. They're now, now a threat to the Causeway Hospital Enterprise Zone, which has not been populated, and uh, a data centre running at 5%. Listen, you're only part of a large problem, but thank you very much. Thank you, Morris. Thank you. Um, the last question is Mark on Legacy. Oh, sorry. At the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee in June, the Deputy Chief Constable stated in relation to the British Government legacy legislation that the trust and confidence of victims in these processes is absolutely critical. Now, six months later, with the legacy bill moving to committee stage in the House of Lords, I'd ask the Chief Constable from his and PSNA contact with victims and survivors is there evidence of much trust and confidence in these uh, proposed legacy processes or is there more evidence of opposition and alarm? Uh, does the Chief Constable have a view on potential damage to hard-won gains on the rule of law here if the legacy bill becomes law? Thanks, Chair. I mean, th th there's clearly a lot of huge and fundamental questions that you raised there, Mark, and very important ones. Um, I think, obviously, Mark was very experienced in the legacy process. Before he was deputy, as you probably know, he led on this when he was in another role. So he's, he's invested in, in resolution. Uh, and obviously, there's a number of dimensions to our own immediate response. I think we've always taken a, a, a position organisationally, uh, as has been echoed in here on a number of occasions, that we don't want to get drawn into a commentary around the rights and wrongs of, of government legislation because we're here to be impartial and we have stayed away from the development of different bits of the legislative process as it has iterated as you know through the various stages of the parliamentary process. Um, I, I think in, the, in relation to the, the other outworkings of that though it would be fair to say because it's a matter of in the public domain it's not just reflected in any conversations we have there isn't much evidence of support in various lobby groups or communities and constituencies in relation to proposals as are presented and that will be reflected the conversations that we have had in that space both directly and also for some of the work that we do with 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 canova as as the effects on the rule of law i think again that's the more of a debate for when we get a, an executive the executive because it's a huge constitutional issue and also for the uk government and i think those determinations are best made in those places rather than a view from the police service. Okay, thank you. I just want to ask members, have we captured all the questions in public for the Chief before we move on to the NCA? Villa? Um, thank you, Chair. Um, my question is following on from previous questions that I've put to the um, board and, and in committee a number of times, and it's particularly around children and young people and call out um, by the police. Um, um, I put a written question as to ask how many times police have been called out um, to various locations such as children's homes, Lakewood, Beechcroft, Ivy Centre and respite provision. Um, in one of those um, numbers in particular to focus on in the Ivy, the number was 41 in the last 12 months with the centre that only has around five people at any given time in it. And given that these young people under the age of 18 would not have the mens rea for a criminal offence, um, as to what reason are the police being called out to visit and is the use of force being applied to restrain any of those young people? Because I, I do think there are um, some serious issues um, that need to be raised with the trust here to ensure that we actually have best practice in place and are looking out for the most vulnerable children. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, clearly, it's a very detailed question. I haven't got the specifics in relation to the reasons behind that number of call outs in a place and there's probably if there's been a written request i've not actually seen it so um, we can probably provide a written answer to give that more granularity on the whys and wherefores and then if there's work we need to do through yourselves with a particular place happy to get someone from the team to look at that but i don't have the details of that 
Yeah, I'm happy for a written question then can follow up even at the next board meeting. Thank you, Nilana. Okay, thank you, Chief. Um, so if we can now, if we're happy enough with the any other questions haven't, or oh, everything's been addressed, can we now move on to the work of the NCA and Graham Bigger? Um, you're very welcome. Um, and if you could make some opening comments on your work, and then we can take some questions from, from our, our board. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And uh, it's great to be here again. I was here in December last year when I was the interim uh, Director General back now, um, permanently appointed. Uh, I do consider these sessions to be really important. Is the oral coming over okay? It sounds a bit, yeah, fine. Um, uh, I'm accountable, the NCA is accountable in four directions, um, to the Home Secretary uh, for Policing in England and Wales, uh, to the UK Parliament in London for the money we spend, but absolutely also to, to you for our activity in Northern Ireland and also uh, to the Scottish Government for what we do in Scotland. So really important that I'm here and that we, we answer our questions and are accountable. Uh, I thought I'd say just a brief word on uh, the change in the serious and organised crime picture as we've uh, seen it over the last year since I was here. The change in strategy that we are uh, implementing uh, following my appointment. Uh, and then just a few of the, the bigger results we've had that have got a Northern Ireland uh, kind of relevance uh, and then go over to questions if that helps. So on changes to serious and organised crime, I mean, broadly the picture hasn't changed massively. The two most significant things that have happened UK-wide uh, in relation to serious and organised crime are actually Russia's invasion of Ukraine uh, back in February and the response that there's been uh, to that. And then the increase in the uh, illegal immigration, uh, largely on small boats coming over the channel. So those have been the two biggest operational things that have happened that we are responding to, neither directly um, uh, as relevant to Northern Ireland as they are to, to Southern England. Uh, but on uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, we set up a counter kleptocracy um, task force to try and deal with that and to pursue any illicit finance from Putin linked elites or others that was being laundered through or invested into the UK. And that's been an acceleration uh, and intensification of efforts that we've had in place for the last uh, few years since the Salisbury uh, chemical weapon uh, attack. Uh, and, and has been quite successful. We've had 85 uh, disruptions uh, in, uh, since, since February, including last week, uh, an arrest, as you may have seen in the media, of a, a wealthy Russia, Russian businessman, as we are uh, referring to it in public at the moment, um, which is significant from our, uh, from our point of view. Uh, th that does have a broader relevance because one of the things that's happened on the back of uh, those changes is the, the, the government in Westminster passing new legislation, one economic crime bill that went through earlier in the year, another one that's before uh, the Commons at the moment, which, uh, and if the latter is passed, will really um, improve our ability to understand where money is going and, uh, and go after uh, illicit finance throughout the UK and internationally. So it is stopping money being able to be hidden behind a cloak of anonymity. Um, so that will be beneficial, not just for, uh, for Russian oligarchs, but for organized crime in the round. Uh, the second area of change I was going to mention was small boats. We've seen 70,000 people come over uh, into the UK already uh, illegally from over the Dover Straits. That's a significant uh, increase. There is you know, a real risk to people as they do that. And we saw tragic deaths last year in the Channel uh, when one of the boats overturned. Uh, there is organised crime that is facilitating that. And so we are focused along with a range of partners, both domestically and internationally, uh, on trying to identify and disrupt uh, those organised crime gangs. And we've had some success this year, although uh, the flows continue. Um, moving on to our, our strategy chair, um, we are now trying to move the National Crime Agency, so and particularly for new members who will have had less to do with the NCA, I mean, we are roughly 6,000 um, people, a budget of about 800 million, uh, with a remit across the UK, but that absolutely operates internationally as well. Um, we have three broad rules that are relevant here. Um, we operationally lead the UK's fight against serious and organised crime. So that is just pulling together all partners, including the PSNI, to make sure we've got a, a single overall, overall approach that will have the best effect. So that's a governance and planning function. Um, we investigate and uh, disrupt individual bits of criminality ourselves. So we absolutely have our own investigators, intelligence officers. Uh, we take 
cases with the Crown Prosecution Service in England and Wales, uh, PPS here to, to court. Um, and then thirdly, we also provide a series of services to police forces, including PSNI, um, that can help them in doing their work. So those are the things that we broadly do. In how I'm looking to shift and change the agency, I'm, I'm wanting us to get better at the way we do the first of those functions, leading, leading the whole system to make sure we get the very best combined effect out of, out of what we collectively do. And that's just making sure we are um, better in our intelligence gathering, better in our assessments uh, and our performance management. Um, uh, and then in our operational activity, which is the bulk of where our effort goes, um, we are moving the organization uh, more upstream, more overseas and more online. Um, and that is, uh, that is to, to follow where the crime is. That's that is the, the changes in the crime threat that we are seeing, um, particularly moving online. The fact that organized crime uh, is very often international. There's very little that is purely based in one, uh, in one country. Um, and it's because of where it's where we think we can have the biggest impact in a way that is not then overlapping, for example, with what Simon and his team are doing uh, in PSNI or other police forces around the country. So that's how we're shifting. I can say more about that in questions, helpful, um, the strategy of the agency. Uh, one thing that, that might result in, uh, in terms of my appearances before here, is the disruptions that we are reporting in our reports to you may actually go down, the total, the total number of disruptions. What should not go down is the impact that we are having um, on the streets of Northern Ireland uh, at all. The impact should go up, but the actual number of minor disruptions that we're recording might, might go down. So I just mentioned that as a heads up for reports that you may see in the future. Uh, but it's absolutely with a design for the impact on the streets of the UK, including Northern Ireland, to be, to be greater. Uh, finally, then, I'll just run through a, a few results, and we might come back in more detail to CSEA, uh, child sexual abuse. I'm sure you've got questions on that. Uh, so, but one of the big results we've had um, over the last year was against the Kinahan uh, Organised Crime Group when we're thinking about drugs and money laundering. Uh, that's been a three-year uh, investigation and operation into one of the biggest organised crime groups operating uh, in Europe, um, based initially out of uh, Ireland, uh, with the principals moving to Spain and latterly the UAE but absolutely pumping drugs into uh, the whole of the UK, including uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, and where we got to in April, in, after you know, a, a lot of effort and joint working with, with PSNI, but with uh, the Garda, um, with uh, the Peace Nacional and the Garda Sevilla in Spain, and with the US uh, Drug Enforcement Agency, uh, was the imposition of financial sanctions by the US, who have the ability to do this, on the organized crime group. So they are slightly beyond our reach at the moment in terms of um, prosecution, uh, but these financial sanctions can be absolutely debilitating for very significant organized crime groups like uh, the Kinahans. So that has been a major success for us um, collectively. Uh, we arrest and prosecute where we can, and uh, the, the, the leader of that OCG in uh, GB, uh, we arrested and convicted last year, and he said taken 20 years at Tommy Kavanagh. Uh, and the main money launderer that supported that group was arrested uh, in Spain, uh, along with his partner in September. So some really useful and uh, positive operational activity there. Um, uh, I wanted to mention asset recovery as well. It's been a topic of interest for um, the board and absolutely is for, uh, for me as well. So we had our first account freezing order uh, in April in Northern Ireland. Uh, now that the, the Criminal Finances Act is in place uh, here. Uh, so that is a really useful um, step forward for us. Um, it's on a relatively small amount of money, um, but we think it can have uh, a significant impact on uh, the, the individual and the criminality we suspect them of being involved uh, in. Uh, and we've coupled that with uh, other civil orders that we can have a bankruptcy order uh, in that case, which is for 200,000. So the first time we've done it and good to kind of cross that line and start doing it. Uh, you've had questions before um, about unexplained wealth orders, which you know, now we are able to use here too. Uh, and we have one uh, going through the court process at the moment. So not yet in place, but we have made an application for what would be the first one uh, on someone that is based in Northern Ireland. Uh, these are not tools that we, we use, uh, the UWOs are not tools that we use in volume uh, in the rest of the UK uh, either. They are very useful. Um, they're a good tool in our arsenal, but they're quite niche in where we can apply them. Uh, so 
we will use them where they are useful and relevant, uh, and it feels like it will be in this particular case, uh, but not uh, more broadly. Uh, and then finally on uh, asset recovery, uh, I mean, a number of other actions we have taken, but uh, particularly useful was a civil recovery order that we got in July um, this year against an individual with uh, alleged links to the UDA, um, and that's been on properties of £85,000 and uh, an account with almost £30,000 in it. So we're using these tools in conjunction with the PSNI uh, as aggressively as we can, uh, sensibly, to target criminality, particularly where it's paramilitary linked, um, as, we, as we see it. Uh, so that's asset recovery. Um, uh, I'm sure you'll have questions on CSEA, so I could leave that to then. I don't want to take up too much time. Uh, I'm happy to talk about fraud. Um, I did want to call out one final point, Chair, if I could, which was some really positive activity that we supported, but which PSNI led uh, recently, and I think was in their report, which was into uh, what we call modern slavery and human trafficking, but in this particular case, sexual exploitation. Um, and that was the, the, the raids that PSNI did on 27 brothels um, uh, um, around Northern Ireland uh, uh, two or three weeks ago now which linked to a broader piece of work that we had been doing uh, identifying particularly Brazilian and Thai women who had been uh, trafficked to the UK and then uh, used in prost prostitution so we provided some intelligence support to that activity but it was absolutely carried out um, by PSNI led to two uh, arrests and charges and uh, that's really good to see because it is one of those crimes that often is not not seen as much as it should be or gets the attention that it uh, deserves so really pleasing to see that i'll pause there chair and happy to take questions thank you graham we have a couple of questions across across our board the first one is from mark with a supplementary from edgar on the northern Ireland spend thank you chair and uh thank you graham with the NCA budget close to five hundred million pounds, could I ask in general terms what would the Northern Ireland allocation be? Uh, so the, our budget is actually eight hundred and eleven million pounds. Um, it gets confusing in our accounts because there's a, the core spend and then money we get from different sources. So, uh, but in in total this year it is uh, eight hundred and eleven million pounds. Um, I don't have a figure to give you, um, Mark, and I, I'll happily take it away and try and work out how to provide one. Um, the challenge is we have a, a team, you know, based here, um, some of whom are working on work that is absolutely specific to Northern Ireland, but some of whom we base in, in Northern Ireland as we base around the UK, but they're doing national work. And then we have people based around the rest of uh, the UK, and then indeed 150 international liaison officers in 50 countries. Who are providing a service to the UK, which includes Northern Ireland. So being able to split out what is direct and specific for Northern Ireland is uh, is quite challenging. But I'll I'll take it away and uh, try and come back with with something that, that answers your question. Thanks, Graham. No, I appreciate there be a degree of complexity uh, to it, but it was just in, in general terms to find out sort of what's been spent, not not even what's been spent here, but what's been spent on here. But thank you. Okay, thank you, Mark and Edgar. Supplementary. Thanks, and good to see you, Graham, and thank you for your report. Uh, it's really uh, links into Mark's question because my understanding is that the PSNI actually uh, pay you for some of your work, and uh, we we scrutinise PSNI budgets very thoroughly uh, within the board and particularly within the Resources Committee. Uh, and I suppose my, my question for you, Graham, is is uh, how can you demonstrate value for money uh, for the contribution which PSNI makes to uh, NCA? Thank you. I mean, happy to consider with you any ways we can do it better. Obviously, we provide our reports to you every uh, every quarter, and I think the value comes uh, in all three of the roles that I outlined for the N uh, for the NCA initially. So, leading the overall system, we are producing intelligence reports and assessments that are informing how we approach serious and organised crime across the country, including in Northern Ireland, that will be useful to Simon and his team. We provide a whole range of coordination. And, um, and that helps shift, for example, the legislation that you know, we all operate on. That helps shift the way that the private sector, be it the financial sector or the tech sector, um, works, and, and therefore the protections that people throughout the UK, but including in Northern Ireland, benefit from. Uh, our own operational work, uh, some of it is in Northern Ireland, um, working with the PSNI, some of it is broader, but will absolutely affect 
crime that takes place in uh, in Northern Ireland, and then thirdly, the services that we um, that we provide in support of of Northern Ireland, be it um, uh, suspicious activity reports that come into our financial intelligence unit and then are farmed out to all the different police forces, including uh, PSNI. It could be the international uh, liaison officers that. You know, for example, there's a really good case that uh, PSNI did on uh, another modern slavery case, um, which was Nigerian individuals, and it was our international liaison officer uh, out in Abuja that could secure the evidence that was necessary to get the convictions uh, here, and that is a you know, resource that you can tap into. Um, it's specialist support that we can provide on individual cases. So, um, you know, the, the the tragic case of of Lisa Dorian. Um, uh, who you know, disappeared in 2005, absolutely a PSNI lead, but we have got experts on, on forensics, on, on victim engagement, on geographic locations and searches that we provide out to all the police forces to support in, uh, in the individual and very difficult investigations they are doing. So there's a whole range of ways that, that, that we support. And to the amount of money, the kind of just over 1 million that is provided, I think, I think there's a very significant return on that, on that spend. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is Frank, if, uh, in terms of child sexual exploitation and a few other supplementals after that one from Nuda. Hi Graham, I'm back to this question. Um, I think I, I let out the last time my views on it, but I'm very keen to, to hear from you and the actions that you're going to take, or the actions you are taking at the minute, to drive this fear that we all have for our children, grandchildren, etc., out of our society. And which I absolutely share. I mean, it's a good question. We had a good discussion on it um, last time I was here. And actually, I hope my answer will also go some way to answering Edgar's question as well, because you will, I hope, see the things that we are doing nationally and internationally, which will benefit um, people everywhere, including including here. So, I mean, I, I gave you some quite startling figures last time I was here about the, um, the, the, the scale of the threat, um, the number of people that we assessed could pose a sexual um, risk to children based on our kind of detailed analysis. Or we'll come out with a new figure in the new year. It won't be um, uh, very different from what we talked about uh, last year, but we have, we have, we've narrowed the range slightly and we've got increased confidence from further analysis we've done that it's not far wrong. Um, but the figure last time was 550 to 850,000 people in the UK who we thought posed some degree of sexual risk um, to children. Um, so we've done more work on the scale. We've got greater confidence around um, uh, around that. Um, I think another thing that's that's happened over the last year is the the ICSAS publication, so the Independent Inquiry into Child Sexual Abuse that uh, uh, the Westminster Government commissioned uh, and has been going for for some time. That reported um, last month. We had fed quite heavily into that on. Uh, our view on the law enforcement response to that and what else needed to change in society and particularly with the tech sector. Uh, and so there have been some good recommendations coming out of, uh, coming out of that. In terms of the, the scale, um, and I, I talked about this a, a bit uh, last time I was here, but one point I, I didn't cover was, while we think um, the scale of abuse and risk that is out there has grown uh, over years and has grown uh, very largely because of the internet enabling more material to be circulated and more people effectively to be radicalized in their sexual preferences. It has also provided us with a new avenue to spot child abuse that's happening because of course it has happened uh, for time eternal. Um, still the, the vast majority of it happens within families or, or kind of close friends. But what we are finding is that by, able, by, by being able to see people sharing images, indecent images of children online, because most people who, who contact abuse children also share images and are on, on websites, we are getting greater visibility of who they are. So we are being able to identify and then arrest people who otherwise we would never have seen. So there is a kind of a silver lining to the internet cloud uh, on, on this issue. In terms of what else we're, we're doing around it, so we have uh, lobbied hard various people for changes that we think are necessary. So I mentioned last time I was here that um, I was hopeful and excited about the online safety bill uh, coming into the UK Parliament. Now that's had a, a bumpy ride um, uh, since I've been last here, but it is now back uh, before Parliament, the UK government taking that forward, which is really important. That is going to put a different level of duty on particularly 
the tech sector and the social media companies to protect children. Uh, and that really matters because I think that is the biggest single lever that there is to try and reduce the protection of children is limiting both the amount of illegal material that's circulating online and the ability of people to, to share it within um, kind of small closed groups. Um, a second development, which again we've been a big part of, um, is the agreement of the UK-US Data Access Agreement. So, uh, and this came into force in October. And this is the ability for us to go absolutely immediately to um, tech companies in the US, be it Meta or Google or others, and, and ask them, compel them to give us uh, material, either on an intelligence basis or for use in evidence which we could do before, but only through an international letter of request and mutual legal assistance, which would take a couple of years. So that was, we've worked hard and lobbied hard on that for a number of years. And then the US passed legislation, which enabled it. And then we managed to sign a treaty and we're the first country to be able to get that access from the US. So that will help with our um, investigations. The tech sector are, of course, doing a lot already to try and reduce the prevalence of the material. So, I mean, they run algorithms to identify and reduce and take off material, and it gets taken down in, in mass volume, but it also gets put up in mass volume. And so we do need them to work harder at that. Uh, the final thing on the tech sector I'd mention is that we, we get an enormous number of uh, leads um, from the tech sector in general through uh, NECMEC, the organization in the US that they go into and then they come to us. Um, and that works because the tech companies are able to see what's going over their systems. They run our algorithms, they spot it when they see something unlawful, uh, they pass it to us. Uh, a number of them, uh, but particularly Meta, are looking to put some of their messenger, uh, their social media onto end-to-end end, end -end encryption. And when they do that, unless they, unless they do something else as well, they then won't be able to see the indecent images, so they won't be able to refer them to us. And so all the leads that we get and that we analyze and we disseminate out to PSNI and other forces will just dry up. So we're engaged in an ongoing negotiation that is quite testy um, with those companies to ensure that if they are going to move on to end-to-end -to -end, end -to -end encryption, they do it in a way that still allows them more anonymously to identify that material and provide us um, with the tips. So there's a lot of activity we're doing in that space to try and reduce the, um, the amount of material that is circulating. Um, we are also, I mentioned this last time I was here, uh, we do a lot on education. So how can we help children and parents and teachers and social workers understand the risk and protect um, children for it? So I mean, that work continues. We did an extra campaign over the summer on staying safe uh, over the summer. That material's there, it's downloaded uh, an awful lot. Finally, um, well, what I haven't said is what we are doing in the pursue space and actually investigating and arresting people. So uh, very briefly on um, that, we get a lot of intelligence in either from the tech companies or our, our own um, searching and analysis of the dark web. And when we find uh, something that's suggestive of indecent images of, of children, and we can geolocate it to a force area, then we will disseminate that out to the individual force, including PSNI, and they are cases that they can then uh, follow up, and there's some data on that in the, uh, in the report. What we do, additionally, is try and focus on uh, the dark websites that are hosting a lot of this material. So that's what's emerged over recent years is um, on, on the dark web, sites that you can join and often you have to bring your own first generation imagery to be able to get kind of through the door uh, but then you can access millions of images and videos uh, and you can kind of chat with uh, similar minded people so a really big effort from us and from other international law enforcement organizations and indeed you know, intelligence organizations gchq assists with this is to identify these dark websites penetrate them find out who is running them because you know there are moderators and administrators who who prop them up and make them work um, arrest the individuals who are doing that and take the sites down and we've had some quite good success on that over the last year in identifying those sites and then in one particular case that I can, I can cover more in the private session then get it taken down so a long answer but there's an awful lot of activity no just a, just a personal thank you and um, very reassuring and very comprehensive from the answer thank you Okay, thank you very much. Um, Nula? Thank you, Chair. Um, that was very comprehensive and, and, and thank you um, very much um, for the answer. I, um, if you 
if you may and you might not be able to give us the numbers but um and i understand in the new year you say there will be new statistics out as to the um individuals who may pose varying degrees of risk um you said the, the 500 to 800 thousand mark do you know how many of those are actual individuals who pose risk to children in in northern ireland are you able to actually ascertain those figures um, so not not really. I mean, it, it was um, so 550 to 850 was the figure across the UK. Just by doing a calculation based on population, that turns into 16,000 to 23,000 in Northern Ireland, which is the figure I used um, last year. But that's not based on any assessment of the greater or lesser extent of, of this in Northern Ireland than anywhere else. It's just a straight calculation based on um, on population. Um, and these are not these are individuals who we assess pose some degree of sexual risk to children that includes viewing material uh, online and now that's not direct contact abuse but if there's material online someone some child has been victimized by the production of that image and they may have been contact abused at the same time so it's still very serious from our point of view um they are not also individuals that we know that is they are often uh, I mean, it's a statistical bit of analysis that, that multiplies up in a number of factors. We know this and therefore we can assume the following that's been verified by, by various academics. Um, and we then, we then looked at it alongside, for example, the number of people that we can see IP addresses trying to engage with this material online, and that helps validate the figure. So we have high confidence in the figure, but it is not identified individuals. Otherwise, clearly, we would, we would go and do something about it, albeit you know, if it is between 550 and 850,000, given there are roughly 80,000 places in prison uh, in the UK, I mean, we would have a bit of a significant challenge at that point. And um, thank you. I guess um, maybe it was naivety to think that um, it might be easier to actually establish with with our individuals are within Northern Ireland. Um, I assume um, in terms of software and at locating IP addresses, et cetera, that there's a, there's a vicinity um, or a region rather than a, an address. Um, so that that's not something that um, you're actually able to do versus, I know there's the on online stuff, but there's also child exploitation that, that isn't um, <laughs> online. So with the online, you're, you can't um, kind of drill down into those specifics. Um, I guess it might, might, might be, um, naive question in terms of looking how actual um the development of web works but i i had assumed that maybe that was something that is done so you can ascertain that there's people here so up, up to a point um so the the initial figure was based on a statistical model that said we know this we know this and if you make these assumptions then it'll come up to this overall figure which is kind of an academically produced figure it is not a series of ip addresses that we have as it happens that links quite well with, with the kind of IP addresses that we see or the number of searches. Um, but, but you have to go through a series of steps to be able to geolocate um, from, from getting a kind of trace online. And wherever we can do that, clearly, we absolutely do. Um, and when it looks like it's in Northern Ireland, we'll refer it over to, to, to Simon. And his ability to take action then depends on whether you can locate it down you know, to an individual house, which you can't always do it, uh, do that. Um, but of course, people online uh, and particularly if they are undertaking this activity, really go to the utmost lengths to try and protect their identity um, and using VPNs and various different techniques to obfuscate it. And then I've got, you know, amazingly gifted um, cyber experts who are doing their very best to try and defeat that anonymization and, and, and with in increasing success. But there is, I'm afraid, not a, we, we can't just go to, it's there for this, this person or this number of people in one, in one particular area. Okay, thank you. And um, Jerry, for another supplemental on this? Well, it follows on from, I think, Nila. I mean, there are horrific uh, statistics from 550,000, 150,000. So I wanted to tease that out of you because it's also 300,000 of a difference. And you're saying it's, it's a statistical uh, uh, um, diagnosis, if you like. Do, do you have some notion of, uh, or some idea of, out of that in percentage, how much then does, does actually come into the arena? of police or yourselves being able to um to do something about it i suppose is is is, is the, the question yeah no thank you um so i mean the range will will narrow uh, when we publish it next year but it will still be a range it's a, a piece of statistical analysis um 
the numbers that we can then you know do something uh, about I, I i i would have to check this but i think we disseminated uh, something like 10,000 reports uh, out to policing uh, last year uh, i'm not certain that figure so let me kind of come back and confirm which is clearly a small proportion of the you know the number we started with, <coughs> but is those um, from our work on the dark web and the input we get from uh, from NECMEC that we can begin to geolocate uh, at least up to a point. So we get more inputs than that, but some of them are leads that we just can't follow up and find uh, uh, find a location for. But I, I think around 10,000. If I can confirm that before the end of the session, I uh, I will. And so, yeah, that's above the jurisdiction. That's right across. That's across the UK as a rule. I mean, it, it would be helpful if we could get that because it gives some notion. I mean, and I know you've explained this is that it's uh, for and, and every uh, act of abuse is uh, horrific, but I mean, they, they come on, on several levels, as, as you pointed out. Um, not dismissing them, but the other question was do you have a view on, and, and maybe the Chief Counsel as well, on if, if it's sentencing, if the sentencing is appropriate, not necessarily appropriate, if, if because that's really up to the courts, but is, is there, is it wide enough for if you take the different levels of abuse? Um, because we're looking at stuff, certainly I see it, you know, coming up now and again, and usually on the report, and especially if somebody pleads guilty, they just say it was sexual abuse. And, and nobody particularly wants to know what that is, but the question I think in everybody's minds, because the last one I heard in the last week, I think was, uh, it was historical and they had involved two uh, young girls and they, they got probation and and that's free. Um, so it's it's a question maybe for yourself and to your principal. Is, is there a view that, that needs changed, that needs adapted, that needs reviewed um, to see if what is happening? And I take your point about the number of prison, um, you know, prison places there are and all of that, but I think that's what if you, if you hear a reaction, that's the most the biggest reaction you hear. What you know, what probation, you know, because it's 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 actually used. So what we see is, and um, Simon, I want to come in with the Northern Ireland experience, but um, where we're able to prove um, contact abuse of children, we tend to get very lengthy um, sentences. Occasionally, not quite to the extent we want, and we uh, we appealed one uh, recently back in the UK, um, where actually. You have kind of an in-between level of abuse. So people physically contact abusing someone they are in touch with. Um, at the other end, looking at images online, but never actually contacting uh, a child. And then another area that we have been focusing on a lot recently, because it has been growing in scale, is people who, who actually contact children online, ask them to pass, pretending to be someone else very often, ask them to pass uh, them images, and then increasingly blackmail them into more and more extreme acts. Um, um, we have seen more and more of these, and we had a big case that went through the courts um, uh, in uh, South England um, a month ago um, with, I mean, really horrific abuse. Uh, we've got one that's live at the moment, and our officers were here in Northern Ireland, and, and, and the perpetrator is not based in Northern Ireland, but one of the people that, that they had contacted was, and we were, we were here um, safeguarding the victim uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so we appealed a sentence there because we think that that harm is really significant and we don't think the judge had quite taken that into account. Um, but the area where I'm, I am worried about uh, the levels of sentencing for child sexual offences is when it is um, just, in inverted commas, viewing of images. So we arrest people and they'll have a million images. They are graded to A, B and C depending on the severity, but they can be you know, really significant images of child abuse. But very often, when it is just in inverted commas that viewing, people get suspended sentences, which may have been um, the kind of example of what uh, you were referring to as well. So they get two years in a sexual harm prevention order, but the sentence is suspended for two years and they don't actually um, go to jail. And that is pretty common across uh, the UK and something that does not leave me feel very, feeling very comfortable. Okay, thank you. Mark, what's the Can I just, first of all, because maybe I'm not written question properly, are you happy then that the, the range of sentences is there for for the different levels of this? In other words, you, you were talking about appealing one. But obviously, if you're going to appeal, that means you can't get it longer. So are you, are you happy with the availability of the width of sentencing? I think is maybe more, more appropriate. 
Sorry, yes, uh, sorry to understand your question. Broadly, yes, it's the application within those sentencing guidelines, particularly for the viewing of indecent images of children, which personally I think is not sufficient. Okay, thank you. Mark, wanted to come in? Yeah, not, not on sentencing, but um, just to go back to the referrals. So we would get around 40 child internet protection referrals per month from the NCA. And what we will do with those is we will then, our officers from public protection branch will go out and carry out a search of devices in the home. And that could be anything ranging from um, children effectively who have been inappropriately um, messaging each other. Um, and then there'll be an appropriate um, response to that, right up to adults who are seeking to meet underage uh, people um, and, and offending of that nature. So just to bring some clarity back to the point around the, the huge figures that Graham is talking about, drilling that down into the referrals that actually come through to ourselves. Um, and that supplements obviously the work that we do in, in public protection branch. And we're working very closely uh, with the NCA around refining those referrals and, and um, working through that process. But that, at the moment, that's what we would be dealing with per month. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to go to Trevor now, which is a question on the Kinnikin investigation, please. Maybe I'm direct this. We want to say first, <clears throat> can I commend you in terms of work that's been done? I think it's like a satellite view of everything that's going on. And then we actually hear some of the successes. You, re you referenced the, the brothels. Some of us are familiar with some of the raids with the PSNA in terms of the drugs. Those things are all wonderful. Um, but in your comments, you talked about some of the criminal gang work. We're all very familiar with the, the leader of Sinn Féin and their connection, according to the courts. Um, will you be looking specifically at that court case whenever those recordings are used in terms of uh, Mary Lou McDonald's connection with the criminal gangs? And will you be working in co uh, connection with the police to investigate that if that is used in the courts? Uh, so not at the moment. I mean, we will look at what comes out and investigate where we see the evidence taking us. Um, but our focus on the, the, the Kinahan group has been the overseas connections at the moment, largely based in Dubai and trying to disrupt, disrupt them. Um, if new evidence comes out, it may be for the Garda to uh, investigate rather than us, but we'll discuss with, with, uh, with Simon and the team and, and the Garda. Thank you. And our last question with Michael. Okay, thanks, um, Graham, and, and well done, certainly, on your recent successes. Thanks, thanks very much for the reports. Just, just briefly, um, given that some of the statistics, as I, as I interpret the reports anyway, suggest that uh, there has been some downturn in certain areas in terms of, of performance in Northern Ireland, drug seizure levels, and also the number of ser uh, major SOC disruptions, might the Director General, um, along with the Chief Constable, advise the Board to what extent PSNI budgetary pressures uh, might impact the capacity for NCA and PSNI to deal with these significant crime threats, um, and whether the budgetary or capacity constraints are currently impacting performance or likely, likely to do so as we move forward? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, budgets anywhere in any organisation always uh, kind of impact what you what you can do. Um, uh, we, we are not being cut at the moment. I mean, that may come uh, kind of in, in, a, in a couple of years, uh, years times, but, but we are all limited in what we can do. And uh, I think uh, Simon and I, I, I have been talking about this and it's part of our leadership of the serious and organized crime system. It's about trying to be really robust and analytical in where we put the effort that we've got and prioritization. Um, so we will, we will all in our various different jobs kind of argue for the, the most resources we can to do the very best job for the public that we can get. But we also then need to make sure that we are spending as much time thinking about right with what we've got, how can we make the biggest, the biggest impact so, I mean, that's part of why I want to take the NCA, as I said, upstream, overseas and online, because based on our, on our analysis of crime, that's where we think we can put in the limited chips we've got and have the, the biggest impact on crime and the harm that it presents to, to all our publics. Um, 
So specifically on, on that, Simon and I are going to commission a, a piece of work within the NCA and PSNI just to make sure that the activity that we've got going at the moment is really focused on the things that we're going to think we think make the biggest difference. And it's very easy because, you know, as people investigate, they find a lead, they, they find something that's interesting and that they can address. And so unless you really keep on that and have those occasional reviews, you will find yourself drifting into absolutely investigating crime, and that is worth doing, but not necessarily the stuff that's going to make the biggest difference. So that's what Simon and I will be doing over the next few months. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and that's the end of the questions this side of the table. So can we say thank you for both for your reports and for taking questions to all those joining us here and online. Uh, this is our last board session before Christmas. So can I take this opportunity to wish everyone a safe and peaceful Christmas and extend board thanks to all those within policing, the NCA and all the other emergency services, services who will be working over the festive period and new year to keep us all safe. Please follow their guidance and advice. And thank you.